Okay. Bienvenue. Welcome. Thank you everyone for coming to the 88th event of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Technologies Speaker and Workshop Series. I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum, and I'm a professor of feminist and social justice studies at McGill and the organizer of this series. The Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Technologies Speaker and Workshop Series seeks to bring together scholars, creators, and people in industry working at the intersections of digital humanities, computer science, feminist studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history, and critical race theory. I'm so excited to welcome you all. Some notes on accessibility. Tonight, we have two ASL interpreters, Christy and James. If you would like to see their interpretation through the event, you can navigate to the view corner on the Zoom webinar. We've also pinned their videos, but that view will let you access all of the panelists. As is the case with all of our hybrid and virtual events, we have cart captioning in English tonight provided by Max. You can turn your captions on at the bottom of your screen. Tonight, we have a Q&A option available. So throughout the event, you may type your questions into the question and answer box, and there'll be some time during the second part of the event for Dr. J. Preet Beardy to answer them. We can't guarantee that every question will be answered, but we are grateful for the discussion that you generate. We have quite a few more events coming up this semester. Our next event is on January 29th. We will have a new hybrid event. Dr. Sasha Guccione will talk about AI and climate change. You can find our full schedule as well as video recordings of our past events at disruptingdisruptions.com. That's the redirect URL disruptingdisruptions.com. The other URL is way too long to remember. You can also find our list of sponsors, including Shirk, Milieu, Rakef, and more. As we welcome you into our homes and our offices through Zoom, and you welcome us into yours, let us be mindful of space and place. As many of you know, past series speakers Suzanne Kite and Jess McLean have pointed to the physical and material impacts of the digital world. The topic of the environmental cost of digital technologies will also be addressed this semester in two other upcoming events. While many of the events this semester are virtual or hybrid, everything that we do is tied to the land and the space that we are on. We must always be mindful of the lands that the servers enabling our virtual events are on. Indigenous communities are disproportionately impacted by the mining practices used for the materials that are used to build our computers and digital infrastructure. Furthermore, as the series seeks to draw attention to power relations that have been invisibilized, it is important to acknowledge Canada's long colonial and current political practices. This series is affiliated with the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies of McGill University. McGill is located in Jajoge, Montreal, on unceded Ganyangahaga territory. Furthermore, the ongoing organizing efforts by Indigenous communities, water protectors, and people involved in land back movements make clear the ever present and ongoing colonial violence in Canada. Interwoven with this history of colonization is one of enslavement and racism. This university's namesake, James McGill, enslaved Black and Indigenous peoples. It was in part from the money he acquired through these violent acts that McGill University was founded. These histories are here with us in this space and inform the conversations we have today. I encourage you to learn more about the lands that you are on. Nativeland.ca is a fantastic resource for beginning. Now for today's event, Dr. J. Pri Verdi is an award-winning historian whose research focuses on the ways medicine and technology impact the lived experiences of disabled people. Her first book, Curing Happiness, Deafness Cures in History from University of Chicago Press in 2020, raises pivotal questions about deafness in American society and the endless quest for a cure. She has published articles on diagnostic technologies, audiometry, hearing aids, and the medicalization of deafness. As an educator, Dr. Verdi has taught at Ryerson University, the University of Toronto, and Brock University. She is currently an associate professor 
at the Department of History at the University of Delaware, where she teaches courses on disability histories, the history of medicine, and health activism. She also serves as co-director of the Hagley Program in the History of Capitalism, Technology, and Culture. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jaypri Verdi. Thank you, Jay. Okay, thank you so much for that, Dr. Ketchum, and thank you all for joining um, this event today. I have to say I really like the framework of these series, especially the Disrupting Destruction title. Um, I think it really gets to the heart of the work that we're doing and the movement for change that we're hoping this scholarship would achieve. So. Thank you again for joining us, um, and I hope you tune in for some of the other talks that are in schedule. So today I'll be talking about um, the futurity. And Deb futurity is a new project that I have been working on, on this idea about how we can center deaf experience and ideas about deafness to shape not just the world around us and how we interact with each other, but also the technologies that we can develop, redesign, and innovate in consultation with deaf people. So let's begin with this object. The object that you see on the screen well, perhaps three times the actual size in the photograph, which made it much clearer to examine the intricate features. Brush bronze with the metal filigree cast over plastic, they resemble these vintage hat bead earrings that one can find in antique stores or perhaps in our own jewelry boxes. Except these ones had a strange addition a curved tube extending from the somewhat flat back, a waist component door for a size 13 button battery and a geared volume switch. These were the sound finder earring type transistor hearing aid created by Sound Ear Incorporated of Mount Crisco, New York in the mid 1960s and they were photographed by Starkey Labs in Minneapolis. And Starkey is still around as one of the um, one of the most prominent hearing aid companies on the market. Now, at first glance, it seemed like these objects, this hearing aid, are an astonishing innovation, perhaps in 1968, even ahead of their time. Technological miniaturization and consumer, however, have been very typical of hearing a design, and these sound finder hearings are no exception. With the flexible printed circuit board consisting of the transistors, so these are featured inside, as well as integrated circuits encased in a space that is no larger than 2.7 inches in diameter, the sound finder hearing aid was still very small and they were especially comparable to the eyeglasses hearing aids, which had technical components built in the frames. Now, certainly, the sound finder could have been an attractive option for deaf users, especially women who wanted discreet hearing aids that could blend in with their personal style. To wear this hearing aid, a user would connect the tone hook, which is that curved plastic tube, to the ear mold, which will then be inserted in the ear. The earring part, the jeweled part, would freely hang downward, and there doesn't seem to be a clip to secure it into the earlobe. Marketed as the hearing jewel, the sound, sound finder earring was promoted as the world's smallest hearing aid, especially for people who had nerve deafness those who hear but don't understand if words run together. Sound Ear Incorporated's president, Thomas, D. Thomas G. Bodrick, 
had previously worked with Tone Master and Arterion, two other very prominent industry companies, and he certainly possessed the engineering and marketing expertise to launch new earring aids on the market. The problem, however, was that this device failed to meet basic standards for hearing aid performance, despite the claims that it was designed for a very narrowly defined group of people who have nerve deafness. Quote, it was specifically designed for those people who need a little extra clarity in conversation while watching television, at a concert, in the theater, or church. To use more modern terminology, it would only be useful for people who have mild deafness, um, people who could still hear but you needed things to be much louder. Now, quite possibly, this product, the sound finder earring, never moved beyond a prototype stage. Rogers' company was quite small compared to the giants of the industry that he previously worked for, and given that the sound finder trademark was not renewed by 1975 when it expired, it's also probable that the company couldn't compete with some of the other hearing aids on the market. But this wasn't the only option for the people who were looking for hearing aids that could be disguised on their body. Deaf consumers don't have a multitude of options for hearing jewels from other hearing aid manufacturers, but instead of being actual hearing aids, most of these jewels were actually accessory attachments rather than standalone instruments. Two decades prior, for instance, Makio created the hearing, which permitted women to conceal the receiver underneath a pair of match earrings secured by a plastic holder. And up on the screen, you can see a photograph of a deaf woman who's wearing the Mercury earring on her ear with a very long wire extending to the back of her head where she has discreetly clipped her receiver, the actual hearing aid instrument, underneath her hair, which is actually being flipped so that we can get a view in this. The receiver was connected to a wire and depending on the preference, it could also be worn um, on the top of a bra strap, sorry, bra strap rather than underneath the hair. This product was designed by Frenton of California, a jewelry designer for Macchio, and the earring could also be fitted for any other type of hearing aid model or specially ordered earlobes. For a while, they were immensely popular with the fashionably deaf woman especially after Macchio plays full-page advertisement in Vogue magazine, and the September 1955 issue was used to promote hearing aids as products that were connected to fashion and luxury, not necessarily medicalized products that stigmatize deaf people. Other companies also incorporated the cosmetic effects of hearing aids with fashion in the 1950s and 1960s, in London, Ardent, in 1951, created a hat for women that included concealed pockets for hearing aid and external battery. So rather than hiding the hearing aid in your hairdo, you would be wearing it in your hat. And other versions of hearing aids were designed to be worn on the wrist or even in special wigs, including one that was created by celebrity makeup stylist Max Factor. An industry giant, Sonotone, in, um, introduced the Sonotron, jeweled pin, and Sonocone hidden microphone. Again, jeweled products that could be used to disguise the hearing aids in the ear. Toe Master created the cordless barrette, and Belltone created decorated microphone covers for the operator hearing aids. And they also disguised their Triumph 5 Super 6 transistor hearing aid as a stainless steel tie clip. As attractive and as adventurous these products could be, they weren't exactly ideal for security. The anchorage to the body was much weaker and could accidentally fall 
and third for damage the transducers, the microphone, and other uh, component parts of the device. Now, further technological advancement in the 1960s and 1970s made it possible for increased miniaturization as the decade passed. We start to see very standardized approach to hearing a design, where behind the ear and the in-ear model start to replace the body-worn units, especially as um, the field of audiology and hearing aid instrument design figure out a way to provide sound in a binaural system, so getting sound in both ears. And as the size reduction of components continued into the 1990s, so too did the availability of design options. And essentially, most hearing aids began to look exactly the same. They had skin colored um, features or a very basic black, brown, or gray design. There was no flexibility in the in bringing in aesthetics or bringing in design elements, you didn't have new designers or world class um, makeup artists or industrial workers all working to improve the design of these hearing aids. Essentially, in the 1990s, the hearing aid industry, then a monopoly of five to six companies, standardized aesthetic design. And models were actually, I'm sorry, the models of hearing aids were offered in a range of color to blend with the skin or hair, rather than to appeal to an individual's personal fashion or stylistic choices. Still, technological innovation continued with the emergence of digital hearing aids and further experiments in improving the power supply and increased to gain or to minimize the microphone feedback or other kinds of harmonic distortion that were commonly faced by um, users who wore analog hearing aid. Essentially, the modern hearing aid, as we see here on the screen, design gave way to medicalization. Philosopher George Estrich writes, every new technology is accompanied by a persuasive story, one that minimizes downsizes and promises enormous benefits. Too often, that narrative frame disability at the cost. And we can see this in the aesthetic design of 21st century hearing aids in Western society. As this sleek industrial aesthetic becomes incorporated into personal technology, especially in things like wireless um, headphones, the design of hearing aids has hardly changed. Also, designers have reconceptualized the shape of hearing instruments by borrowing features from modern architecture, jewelry, and even automotive design. The products are predominantly showcased as prototypes for a, a potential future, a future yet to come in which Genetic engineering could still eradicate deafness, but people still have the will and the financing to purchase one of these more elaborately designed devices. And still, in this future, in this deaf futurity, the central focus is still on discretion, where the old is made new again. So I want to take us back into the early 20th century for just a few minutes. When I first began writing my, my first book, Hearing Happiness, I had two guiding questions. What is it about deafness that forces medical practice trainers to insist on invasive treatment without a guarantee of cure? And why is there this cultural obsession with fixing deafness? I wondered if this push for a deafness cure is due to the fact that as a society, we are obsessed with stories of people picking themselves up by the bootstrap and overcoming their limitations to achieve success as a, quote, normal individual. We are obsessed, even though these stories diminish the fact that normality is relative. Think of how many of you may have been emotionally moved by videos showing deaf person hearing for the first time. The moment 
that this device is switched on quite literally, we are told that the assimilation of this dead person to the world of sound is an astonishing marvel. But we are never shown the struggle that be come before or after. Cochlear implants, for instance, do not restore normal hearing, especially in ears that have never heard sound, but rather they amplify sound without necessarily improving acuity or the clarity of what is being heard. What they're useful for, especially in conditionally deaf people, the people who are born deaf, is that they help as a tool to aid in speech recognition and to acknowledge where sounds are coming from and making it easier to distinguish between different sounds. Wearing a cochlear implant or an auditory brainstem implant does not mean that a deaf person is miraculously suddenly able to speak and hear flawlessly. There is also this need to acknowledge the fact that the process of being switched on often requires years of therapy and adjustment. And sometimes at the end, deaf people end up rejecting the instrument outright and preferring to be deaf. Still, in our culture, the switch on is a very powerful moment. Too often, the lived experiences of disability are disregarded or glossed over in favor of a technological fix that is meant to be a cure. A cochlear implant, for instance, is often framed as a prosthetic cure. And for decades, hearing aids were presented more as cures than as assistive devices. But when we speak specifically about deafness, what happens when the technology that is devised as the cure is turned off, removed, and put Do you become deaf again in need of a cure again and again? So I want us to rethink how we approach deafness and disability more broadly, to consider it as an impression of difference rather than of impairment. And I wanted to start by understanding an often misunderstood concept, disability. We have long been told that disability is suffering, that when it comes to broken and deformed bodies and mind, it is kindness to cure, if not eliminate, the differences. But this is a lie. The late Australian activist Stella Young tells us that we have sold this lie countless of time that disability is a bad thing. I'm sorry, excuse me for a second. There is um, a train track right outside my office and the train is gone. Um, yeah, Stella Young tells us that too often we are told disability is a bad thing and that those who somehow manage to live with the disability are exceptional. Yet living with disability mirrors adaptation. Understanding disability requires acknowledging the variability of human experiences. And researching and writing disability history, moreover, requires that we center disabled people. Just as race, gender, and sexuality are used as analytical lenses for examining historical events, so too can disability. If we examine history through disabled people rather than the perspective of an able-bodied society, then perhaps we can start moving away from these stigmatizing tropes of disability to create new worlds, new futures, where disability is not oppressed but celebrated. So one of the tenets of a post-human vision, for instance, is the eradication of disability through technology. With this sight of no future, as Alison Kafer termed it, the disabled body is merged with AI technology or transformed into a prosthetic superhuman. And for, um, 
This worthy philosopher Stuart Murray describes this concept of you know, future as disability futures are almost never thought to be desirable and they appear rather as fraught spaces of struggle. So if we're going to incorporate disability and think of dis disabled futurity or in my uh, research area, deaf futurity, we must create crypt futurity with the sense of collective knowledge and imagined possibility. A future where disability is welcome and, and the knowledge of disabled investors and thinkers that are used to shape the future structures. Just imagine that for a second, a truly accessible world with ramps, braille, caption, sign language, guaranteed health care, governed by freedom of movement and freedom of safety. A future perhaps one day will be more than a dream, but a right for everyone to live in peace. So I am a historian who had I'm a historian and a deaf person who had long been fascinated by how spaces and objects can be used to better understand how disabled people engage with the environment to better navigate through their lives. How do they adapt technology to better fit to their bodies? How have they designed or tinkered with their prosthetics or assistive devices or ordinary objects around them to capture their identity and secure their crippled. Above all, how have expectations of normalcy as defined by the dominant culture created tension about what it means to be disabled? Now, I first explored the tendrils of these ideas at my book, in my book, Hearing Happiness. And at this core, this is a book about how cures for deafness imagine and forwarded notions of normalcy that oftentimes contracted with the lived experiences of deaf people. This is a history that incorporates how expectations of normalcy became a comforting cultural standard for many Americans. Normalcy existed within concept of self-cultivation and self-improvement. It was the nexus for identifying good citizenship. An ideal deaf person then was someone who was godly, civic-minded, self-sufficient, and above all, someone who could become hearing. And one of the things I aim to do in this book is actually find stories of deaf people. And let me show you one example. In 1919, a deaf woman named Clara Seaman, who lived in Ithaca, New York, wrote to Arthur Cramp, who was the director of the American Medical Association Propaganda Department, which was later renamed the Bureau of Investigation. The Bureau served as a clearinghouse in which people could write to and obtain information about any medical products that they saw advertised, um, information about the safetyness of a new surgical procedure, or even um, the reputation of a doctor that was treating them or that they were hoping to treat them. Now, as director, Cramp was the contact person regarding the legitimacy of medical therapies available for purchase on the health market. So he was the person that people would write to contact. And many of his letters are kept in the American Medical Archive, which is located in Chicago. And they give us this really rich resource for uncovering deaf experiences with the healthcare system, with how they were um, attempting to cure them, battles of using sign language or hearing it, or struggles with communication with the families, friends, communities, physicians, and so forth. And in this letter, Claire is specifically asking Cram if he could help her select a new course of treatment. And she writes, There are so many earphones, good, bad, and indifferent, and so many kinds of artificial eardrums, etc. The one who is deaf 
spend a lot of time, money, and nerve trying them out. And even if a physician could help, there was no guarantee that the treatment would be permanent. And this is what Clara was hoping Cram could confirm. Was there an effective permanent cure for deafness that she could purchase? And Clara's story is a very common one. Like the thousands of other deaf Americans who wrote to Cramp, these are stories about the presence of normalcy and above all, what hearing happiness meant to those who could hardly hear. So in through the book, I talk about how deaf people and their families, mostly the hearing family, tried ordinary and extraordinary methods in the hopes of curing the deafness. Now, of course, most of these cures were not certain, nor were they painless, but they still did not stop people from either trying or recommending treatment, because if there was even a teeny tiny glimmer of hope that the hearing could be fully restored, then that was a cure worth trying. Because this is what it's like to be deaf in America. Any cure is better than no cure. And deafness is a very highly stigmatized condition. And that's perhaps because its technology and mode of communication makes this invincible disability visible. In 2015, for instance, the Australian company Victorian Hearing targeted an advertisement to people who might be embarrassed to wear hearing aids. The ad with the tagline, hearing aids can be ugly, ours are invincible, show a photo of a woman wearing a shrimp um, or like a pawn behind her ear. And this ad came fire from the came under fire in the deaf community for deaf shaming. But these messages of hearing is being ugly and the need for a vintable model are new messages. They express a level of derision nearly identical to the early 20th century advertisement that boasted the invincibility of their products. It is the stigma of deafness. It's association with poor communication and intelligence and with old age that leads commercial hearing aids to be, sorry, commercial hearing aids to be designed to be hidden. And we can see, still see the same messages if we search through stock images of hearing aids and the first few that show up are always elderly white people wearing gray hearing aids that are mostly hidden in the ears. But if we step back and look at design. Prior to the 19th century, mechanical ear trumpets were bespoke creations designed mostly for wealthy users who had commissioned them. Clients had option of purchasing device that could be concealed against the skin, the hair, or body, or be disguised as domestic furniture and object. Still, despite being beautifully designed, invincibility still was the central design criterion. And many people with hearing issues often turn to various kinds of remedies to elevate their um, deafness quickly, painlessly, and discreetly. And now when commercial hearing aid, commercial electric hearing aid was first introduced in 1898 by American engineer Miller Reese Hutchinson to present a new technological opportunity to improve the amplification power of hearing aids for deaf people. But still, it was, there was still very large devices. There. there were still issues with the technological design and some of the engineering features for improving sound clarity. So further developments in the 20th century led to the introduction of vacuum tube hearing aids that led to drastic transformation of hearing aids and the reduction of their size. And while vacuum tube hearing aids were far from discreet, they were still large, large, they were bulky, they required heavy battery. Most product pamphlets indicated um, that they would need to be hidden in the body. 
they were worn underneath clothing, often in harnesses, as these images demonstrate, to conceal them. But the problem with wearing wearing it like this is sometimes the, the clothing fabric would rub against the microphone, creating interference and poor acoustic quality that led deaf people to reject them. Users testify to hearing aid companies that these types of hearing aids actually reveal their deafness rather than conceal it. So it wasn't really popular and the technological advancement did very little to create a device that would allow a user to pass his hearing. So beginning in the 1930s, hearing aid companies started strategizing how to sell their products to very resistant consumers who not only complain about the discomfort and high cost, but also very candidly expressed embarrassment about exposing their deafness. The president of Sonatone at this time, Irving Chartel, expressed this obvious truth, that nobody wants to put on a hearing aid, and that hearing aids are the most difficult to sell. So in response, Chartel urged his salesmen to target the psychological feeling of shame and inadequacy that obligated deaf people to conceal their deafness. Salesmen carry these messages quite directly to the consumer, making the argument that not wearing a hearing aid was more conspicuous because no matter how well a deaf person can conceal the hearing aid by crafty fashioning on the body, the strained deaf phase of mishearing actually exposed them. And even with further technological innovation after the Second World War, including the printed circuit board and the button battery allowed for hearing aids to be made much smaller and that followed the invention of the transistor which, made, which was made commercially available in 1952. It further made it possible to design more powerful and still small instruments uh, for deaf people. Now these new devices, the transistor hearing aid, were not necessarily cheaper, more reliable, or always more practical than the earlier vacuum tube model, but they were small. They were small enough to be worn in spectacle frame, to be worn behind the ear and concealed in the clothing of skin. Deaf customers were told that they could be hidden. Um, no one would recognize what these instruments actually were. And as technological advancement enabled hearing aids to become smaller, paradoxically, the stigma against deafness increased. Deaf people, the hearing aid industry argued, had no issues for not choosing hearing restoration. The messages and advertisements were quite blunt. To hear was to live. Now, advertisers, of course, we have to acknowledge us, were merely portraying aspirational social realities, which did not always fit with how deaf users integrated the hearing aids with their bodies or their identities. Advertisers' social mirrors distorted and selected what it reflected, which meant that some realities hardly appear at all. What can better hearing mean? for those people who lies unrepresented in the advertisement. Non-white people tend to be historically excluded in corporate archives, and they're not featured in advertisement before the 1960s, but they are a subtle glimpse of the marketing strategy, like ref referencing to matching all skin colors or making discussion between ebony and ivory models. Now, how do we recognize the disparity in how hearing aids were designed with the way they were promoted and used? These devices sometimes feature brilliant aesthetic features, sizes, and fashion, but nearly in all marketing, promotion, and instruction booklets, they're told to be hidden. So what happens if we flip these messages to create products to be shown? Can we move away from the stigma of deafness? 
this design trend towards towards invincibility and miniaturization that came with technological advancement never displaced aesthetics. Colors, style, decoration, or deco feature all encompass the design of hearing aids. What function is there, for instance, with a blue hearing aid or gold one for anything but beauty? If we shift the perspective of this object to perceive disabled use and adaption, then maybe we can ask the crucial question about how disabled people chose and wore these hearing aids. How does being disabled change the way people view the world and the things they created? So I introduced this concept, the disabled gaze, to, as a framework for understanding how how disabled people use instruments and wear them not to hide but to draw attention in a very affirmative way to the disability or the technology to assert their identity as a guard against stigma and ableism. That's a very long-winded way of saying showcasing the instrument is taking pride in disabled living and the disabled gaze serves as an alternative to the often medicalized gaze in which medical experts um, and educators are used to convey very specific meaning about what it means to be disabled. And one of the ways we can work through the disabled gaze is by looking at the history of hearing aid carriers or harnesses. Um, as I mentioned earlier, hearing aid companies advise users to wear harnesses underneath the clothing as a way to hold the hearing aid. But this approach often compromises the functionality of the device because of microphone interference. So deaf users often make their own hearing aid harnesses, and sometimes they share their solution to others um, in deaf magazines and newspapers. And we also see stories of mothers repurposing children's clothing, especially outgrown children's clothing, to make pockets for the children's outfit so they can safely wear the hearing aid or at the very least not get, in, get the um, toddler hand to rip it off. So the wearing of hearing aids um, through this fabric often, sorry, this, this large fabric product tells us something about how deaf people could sometimes take pride in their creation. And here's one of the most interesting carrier I've come across, which was created by deaf painter Dorothy Brett, who lived in New Mexico. And she made this carrier, which you can see in a close up, from buttered leather. And it, she added pieces of silver and turquoise that she stores from the um, local indigenous market. Now, while handmade carriers are a very fascinating material study of the material gaze, when body worn hearing aids were phased out and replaced by model designed to be worn behind or in the hearing aid, we have to look at design a little bit differently. These so called Boeing beige became standard for disappearing the hearing aid against the skin, echoing again the American cultural expectation for normalcy and conformity. But use of preferences for aesthetic customization still continued. Instead of hearing aid carrier, deaf people began modifying the instrument directly. We have custom-made options for colored tresses, which is the outside part of the hearing aid, or changing the color of the ear mold. We have skin cover, stickers, new forms of tubes. You can log online and find um, find like an instruction plan for how to make your own hearings by uh, by adding your own jewelry to your hearing aid. Most of these do-it-yourself adaptations demonstrate the scope of personal aesthetics and design for assistive technology, but more importantly, they showcase the creative possibilities that arise when we push back against the medical gaze of disability and the potential for artistic inclusiveness 
when we incorporate the disabled gay. And we can see this most assuredly in the legacy of fashion and style and in um, hearing aid design. When we move away from this expectation that assistive technology need to be concealed or minimized, we, this requires us to shift how we think about disability. That is, disability is in the opposite of ability. There is a variation of the human condition, a boundless way of interacting in the world. It's beauty in all form, but largely underrepresented and stigmatized in the media. So if we shift our expectation for design as discretion, then we can radically transform how deaf people and disabled people more broadly are represented in society. And I want to finish up by thinking of futurity. Culture influences technological design. So what happens when we stop stigmatizing disability and start to see beauty in difference? So beginning with this sleek industrial aesthetic of digital hearing aids that were developed in the early 2000s, Designers have reconceptualized the shape of hearing aids, often borrowing features from automotive design. And as an experiment, I prompted an AI to illustrate a modern hearing aid. And this is what it looks like. We still see the sleek, cool, modern framework aesthetics that are based on car shapes and a brutalist architecture. We still see white faces. It took me several prompts before I could get a face that didn't have, um, you know, white hair. And how different are they, really, from these ones? The high gloss dawn hearing aid that was introduced in 2008 and designed by Stuart Carlton Design for Starkey. It is actually one of the top um, six hearing aid firms and it received one of the most strategic prizes for design from the Smithsonian Design Museum. It was, it, it was promoted for its visual appeal, but the product description still highlights that this palette of six colors that we see up here are still designed to be, quote, virtually invincible when worn. Other design prototypes were expanding the range of possibility transforming hearing aids into personalized accessories, a few of which are seen here, including using jewelry again, ear gog, reframing hearing aids in glasses, or a music, like a hearing aid where you can see the music uh, in a visual way. These are all still prototypes, and most of them are just art thought experiments. And even the one that are uh, um, available for purchase, like Alice Turner's Amplify, which was branded as a socially inclusive design to rave review, it is still reliant on a very small group of, sorry, reliant for a small group of deaf people, mostly people who rely on bone conduction technology. Older approaches for redesign seem to apply the disabled gaze. Reshifting hearing and design completely into accessory or as wearable art. But some people, of course, prefer concealment, and that's absolutely okay. Historically and now, there are people who decline to wear a hearing aid or refuse other kinds of therapies were stigmatized not so much for being deaf, but refusing to be hearing. And these are messages that show up in the housing colors of hearing aids, as in this one, where we see options for hearing and skin. But this process still remains because as long as that people were expected to pass this hearing and conform to social expectations to assert their normalcy, they were expected to rely on hearing aids, medical treatment, speech therapy, and a host of unconventional other treatments that promises grand miracle but fail to deliver. An advertisement honed in this message, 
By establishing conformity to normalcy, the problem of deafness was promoted as nothing more than the problem of better living. To fail to assimilate into the hearing world meant to be un-American, and to fail to conform was to give up one quest for hearing happiness. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, for your presentation. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to write your questions in the Q&A box below. So if you navigate to the bottom of your screen, you'll see that and you can type in questions. So please do so. While we're waiting for audience questions, I just wanna thank you again for your wonderful presentation. It was fantastic. I have a question about other visions of deaf futurity in addition to um, design of hearing aids uh, in terms of, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes um, I've heard that software isn't updated for some people's hearing aids. And I'm wondering if part, some of the movements for deaf futurity and accessibility have also been user, deaf users trying to control kind of like software for their hearing aids outside of corporate control. Is that also an aspect of deaf futurity that you've looked at or that exists? Absolutely. I think any um, any idea of accessibility or futurity requires full autonomy over a body. And that includes the devices that we wear. So um, just give you from my own personal experience. You know, I, I lost my hearing at age four. And it wasn't until I was about six years old before my parents were able to find the right kind of hearing aid for me. Uh, and it took years of training um, very patient teachers, uh, even more patient parents and siblings to realize that I was sometimes it took, it took me time to be able to hear the world and time to identify like certain kinds of words and and improve my language and my speech. Um, but one of the things that I really liked, even as a child of eight, nine years old, was that the audiologists um, and hearing instrument specialists who oversaw my care actually taught me, for the most part, how to do quick fixes to my analog hearing aid. Um, you know, very simple thing like, oh, there's a loose screw get a screwdriver that you use for glasses and just like tighten it or what to do if there is a water blockage, you know, like very basic maintenance. Mm -hmm. And these were also um, requirements for standard maintenance troubleshooting that people could obtain through instruction booklet, so just very basic troubleshooting. But one of the things I could actually do uh, was open up my hearing aids and to clean them. And that would save my parents a very long trip to my audiologist's office, as well as the cost that I would incur from that repair. I was about 30 years old when I got my first pair of digital hearing aids. And it wasn't something that I wanted for myself. It was more um, being told by my audiologist, the same one that I've had for most of my life. Um, that analog hearing aids were phased out of the mm -hmm. commercial market and that digital hearing aids were it. So if anything had broken with my analog hearing aids, there actually wasn't a company that they could send out for repairs. Oh, there were no parts even being manufactured. I mean, think of it as, you know, VCR technology dying out <laughs> when the DVD and Blu-ray players came in. Um, so, the problem that I found with the digital hearing is was there was no autonomy whatsoever. Um, even adjusting the volume was difficult because the volume was actually set in a very certain range rather than just being more flexible. And the idea was that with digital hearing aids, I would be hooked up to a computer. The computer would read my range of auditory sensation and then configure the range of sound to meet speech, um, to recognize vowel sound and speech sound. 
Another problem with the hearing and design at that time was they're so small and they're not enough space for all the features. So I was given the option of having an adjustable volume switch or having a telecoil feature, which allowed for me to hear on the phone. And the argument was, well, everything going Bluetooth now, so, you know, just drop the telecoil feature. You're not going to need it anymore. But it was the only way I could hear on the telephone. Even now, I can, even when I connect with Bluetooth, I cannot hear on the phone. So that freedom, that autonomy over choices, even something as simple as being able to pick up the phone and make an appointment for myself is completely gone. So instead of finding myself growing older and, you know, being more integrated in my professional environment, I found myself receding. I'm not able to hear on phone. Do I have to ask someone else to make a phone call? Sometimes I have to wait days uh, for someone to be able to make a phone call because it's dependent on their time, not mine. Um, I don't hear as well as I used to. I cannot hear television clearly. I cannot hear music clearly. And these are all things that I had growing up with my previous hearing aid and all options taken away. And the thing is, it's, it's because we're promised digital hearing aids are the future. They're now. Like, we all have to, like, embrace this. Um, but what is the purpose of this future when it's not actually accessible? And the next generation of hearing aids are tied to um, smartphone app, apps, largely, like the software that you mentioned. And some people love it. Like, they love this idea of, like, putting the phone and just, like, switching the feature. Uh, and I hate it. What happens if I forget my phone? Um, what happens if my phone dies? Or what happens if the app is hacked? Like, and I can't address my uh, sound anymore. Like, it seems counterintuitive to have a completely separate product when the thing that I need to help me engage in an auditory environment are in my ear. So I think like any concept of deaf futurity as we can imagine it through the development of technology needs to give autonomy back to the people who need it. Uh, freedom of movement, thinking about how we can have integrated spaces. I've heard rumors, I haven't verified this, but I've heard rumors that even in spaces that would have the telecoil sign, you know, the little ear with the T, that allow people to connect the hearing aid to uh, broadcast, um, those are being removed in public spaces as well. Um, which is usually problematic for people who still prefer that. It, it actually, so the reason that we designed in the first place, we designed with the input from thousands of deaf people who work with engineers to figure out the most accessible space. So it's not a future we're moving towards to. We're creating an alternative timeline where, again, accessibility is going to be a huge problem. So I'm sorry, like, I really love that question. So I'll be talking all night on that. Thank you so much. That was very detailed and wonderful. Yeah. No, we still don't have questions in the Q&A box. So I want to, again, reiterate how much I encourage folks to write questions there. Also, Esley, if you have a question, please chime in. I have another question while we wait. Um, can you talk a bit more about, because this is, a newer project building on your previous book, where you see this project going? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, so my first book was largely a history of capitalism, in a sense. Um, I was interested in how and why their people, their families were choosing some of these treatments um, like these so-called quack and fraud treatment. And I was very much interested as well in how he the hearing aid industry were marketing very specific messages about cultural expectations of deafness and disability to their consumer. One of the struggles I had when I was doing this research is, well, sorry, that the way hearing aids were marketed didn't always translate to how they look like in real life. Um, so in other words, the corporate archive, the advertisement were very limiting 
to understand the actual functionality of hearing aid. So, and I, and I know this again from experience, <coughs> having one hearing aid, and I'm used to like the tinkering of it. Um, so what I started doing was looking into material culture, going to archive collector, and including what at the Smithsonian, where I could go through different kinds of hearing aids and weigh them, look at the wires, imagine how I would wear them. Very nice creators actually let me test them uh, at some time. And after some time, I started to really notice, like I started to move away from the functionality of them, like how we wear them, how heavy are they, how do they work. And I started to realize, oh, you the little blue one. Oh, look at this one. It has like, it's made by Zenith and it actually looks like Zenith um, radio. And I noticed then that, that was very hardly ever promoted. So even if a company was promoting like, the new range of hearing aid model, um, and they would say like, oh, this is this royal blue for the fashionable lady. And that same booklet, the still saying, here's how you wear it. You strap it in your bra. So it, again, it seemed counterintuitive. Why am I going to buy this beautifully designed hearing aid and then hide it? So I became, I really want to think about design some more. Um, and it's not something that people, um, historians have actually looked at regarding 20th century hearing aid. And in relation to that, I also want to see how people adapted to the hearing aid. So like, the, I mentioned it very briefly in my book, Hearing Happiness, about how some deaf consumers were frustrated with the wires, so they made their own harnesses or they added pockets to the clothing. So hearing and harness give us another very material way of thinking about the disabled gaze because it's so personal, right? You have to figure out what works best for me. And you have to pick the fabric, you have to like redesign it. Some women were taking um, the the um, the bar strap, the one that you can like adjust the size. Some of them were taking that and putting it in, in the harnesses so they can have more space. Um, as I mentioned in my talk, mothers were repurposing children's clothing. And then you have people who were just like Dorothy Brett, just completely making their own products. It's such a deeply intimate and personal history of wearability of this connection between individual and a deaf person and a student of mine when i talk about this um is that it's analogous to the way we pick covers for a phone so like you know whether we pick just like simple cases in the back or before some of us wanted like actual leather covers or pouches um so there's something about how we choose the best way to hold our instrument that is still a very tangible part of our identity. This is how we show the world that is mine. So my, I know my phone is not your phone, even if it's the same instrument because the cover is different. So that's kind of like where I'm going um, next with this project. Amazing. And I also want to just say how cool mm -hmm. it is that some of the curators let you mm -hmm. test the hearing aids as well. Mm -hmm. What an amazing archival experience. Um, so mm -hmm. now we have some audience questions. Our first question comes from Shamika, who writes, thank you for this talk. It was very provocative. I am a UX researcher and I'm extremely interested in centering the voices of marginalized people in the creation of future tech. What ways do you recommend the disabled gaze to be applied into equity-centered design or similar frameworks? Um, that's a great question. Thank you for that. And thank you for joining us today. Um, for one thing, you need feedback. Um, you need to bring disabled people, disabled designers into the room where the decisions are being made. Um, and I also recommend like, thinking about the disabled gaze, not as a very rigid formula, but a very flexible one that could be interpreted in any way. All the disabled gaze really is, is showcasing disability, like putting disability in the forefront, taking pride in it, 
um, and that could be done in colors or styles or options um, in functionality it can be done in many different ways and the whole idea is really to move away from this very rigid prescription of I mean again I my expertise is with hearing aids so I always fall back into like hearing aids matching your skin or your hair which is still very very common um, but really to rethink outside the realm of possibility so one of the slide image i showed was um i didn't get a chance to talk about this because i checked my phone and got nervous about the time but it was actually someone who wears hearing aid and they had watched um miss world or miss universe and the model was wearing an earring and they thought that earring looked so cool but I can wear that because it's going to interfere with the microphone of me hearing aid. And if you're not familiar, the microphone is actually like at the top of the hearing aid. So what does this person do? Where they build their own familiar uh, earring and they put it on the hearing aid. So when they wear it, you get that little spikes. That's thinking outside the box. Um, I had the same, the same um, idea when I saw Lady Gaga wearing an earpiece for her to hear the background music when she was performing live and it was this like beautifully glamorous like goo and I'm like oh, I want that I want that for myself um but how do I how do I wear it so that it doesn't Im impair the functionality of my hearing it so these are thinking outside the box kind of things um and it's all personal preference and I think it's really crucial to center marginalized people in the creation of any future technology by not considering them necessarily as like consultants where we can extract information from but as co-designers co-producers co-engineers like equal um expertise in the space where these decisions are being made so thank you so much for that question that question leads, the end of your response leads really well to the next question. Esley, did you want to read it or? Sure, I can. The question comes from Jay Diaz and they say, thank you, Dr. Verdi, for your presentation. I'm really fascinated by your question. What happens when we stop stigmatizing disability and start seeing beauty in difference? And so I'm wondering if you had any thoughts about how deaf futurity might contribute to research methodologies, if at all, at this stage of your work and or projects? <laughs> I don't know, to be honest. I, I love the way you frame it. I mean, I I'm thinking of deaf futurity, uh, and I got to be honest, this is actually one of the first times I'm presenting this for um, lecture on this topic. Um, I don't have any methodologies I'm following, to be honest. Um, what I'm really interested in is not thinking of the future as this, you know, the common idea, like this utopian world where we have this super sleek robotic technology where everybody is happy, yada, yada, yada. But I want to think of futurity as something that is fixed now. Um, alternative spaces where we can rethink how to fit, how we can improve accessibility, inclusiveness, and shift that into design. But it doesn't have to be one or the other. Like looking at hearing it, for instance, doesn't mean saying we can have sign language. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying like, how do we like fit all of that at once? Um, how do we fit the varied auditory spectrum that exists in our world? And how do we reshape how, the way we engage with different people? Um, I don't know. I have no idea what that looks like. Uh, I'm trying to figure it out, to be honest. And my area of focus is looking at hearing aids in the design. Maybe somebody else will want to do something completely different. I don't know. But um, again, it's a, it's a very flexible idea, I think, that we need to think about imagine possibilities and what we can do both individually and collectively. So thank you for that question. Thank you so much. I just want to give people a moment more in case they have another question. If you're currently typing a question, it's also helpful if you write typing, just so we know if the question is coming. Um, while we're waiting, 
Um, I'm wondering if there's anything else too that you wanted to add about your framing of futurity, because I thought that was so like helpful to think of the future as now and kind of a framing of space. Are there other kind of uh, activist work or scholars work or artists work that you're drawing on for that framing? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I would like to see is a shift away from promoting incredible um, designs, but only as a prototype. Mm -hmm. So some of the devices that I chair never move beyond the prototype stage for years. I mean, they won innovators award, design award, um, that people have expressed interest in it. And then they just stay. They never move beyond that. Some of these products have misled the public in being told that they're a prototype, but they're actually just like an art design product, um, which is really disappointing. But the thing is, they look so cool. So they get a lot of media attention. And every time there's a media attention, there's always a group of people who say, where can I get that? How much does it cost? Will, in the case of United States, for the most part, will insurance cover it? And I think that is the problem. I think so much of these designs are again hanging on to the potential future that may or may not exist, rather than thinking about the realities of now. Um, there is a Finnish company, name I am blanking, that recently started to take apart the chassis, so the exterior part of the hearing aid and recrap what that looks like. So they're using like brass and um, other like hammered metal to create, create it so that it's lightweight and it looks like you're actually wearing a, a, an artistic piece, but it's functional. At the moment, from what I understand, it is only for um, people with mild hearing loss, um, which again, tends to be the, the normal standard here. Anytime a new design is introduced, it's always for people with some mild to moderate hearing. Even um, the over-the-counter hearing aids that are sold in the United States, even those are still for mild to moderate hearing loss, but not for the full range of hearing loss. I am seeing greater innovation coming out of mostly Scandinavian countries largely because there is an investment in um, healthcare there that allowed for freedom of design and improvement. And we don't really see that in Canada or um, the United States because the concern is still on keeping the devices as medical products, not as assistive devices or as consumer products. Thank you. I know someone wrote typing. Pippa, are you, is your question almost ready? I think it's coming in a second. One person in the audience mentioned that the question is coming. I, while we're waiting for Pippa's question. Oh, wait, there we go. Okay, so, okay, Pippa wrote, thank you so much for this incredibly fascinating talk. One, can you speak some more about the designers behind these potential future hearing aids? Where do you find people to help design or produce prototypes? And two, where does the funding come for prototypes? Is it all healthcare based in the US? That's, that's a really good question. Um, I cannot remember the name of some of the designers. Um, I'm sorry for that, I didn't write them down. Most of them tend to be people in design schools or engineers who then create a product for um, a thesis or something and then turn it into a company. Um, I don't know how you can find people to help design or produce prototypes. I think you need to find a designer for that. Um, there are some companies that exist. Uh, most of them are Oh, what's the name? 
extruded coating design that I mentioned, the one that I created the hearing aid for um, Starkey, they're actually a design company that also creates like a structure and other kind like like um I believe they are also known for creating very specific stay wares. So there's this design company that reconceptualize how things should look. Industrial design, furniture design, um, is also a very common area where designers come in and like brainstorm new ways of thinking about hearing aids. The funding for most of these products often come from companies um, rather than through healthcare. Um, oh, you're acting as a designer. <laughs> you need to connect yourself to that world. Um, usually, usually design schools have their own like little network of people. Um, but I think in the in the most case, sorry, in many cases, they're not often framed as medical products, but framed as innovative design that has potential to be applied, if that makes sense, okay? Thank you. I think this will be the last question, just to be mindful of our interpreters and captioners, and of course, you as well, Dr. Verity. Uh, so this question comes from Mel, who says, or wrote, I loved this talk, thank you. Can you say more about the cost of hearing aids and how they aren't normally covered by healthcare insurance, mm -hmm. um, depending on like what country yeah. you're in and context, but even with insurance, yeah. How, I, that was my editorializing. So how they aren't normally covered by healthcare insurance, how does this access, lack of access to these devices shape futurities? That's a great question. It's actually something that I'm struggling to look at right now. Um, in the United States, for instance, hearing aids are actually classified as um, commercial products, not as assistive devices, which means that if you are over the age of 18, it's not covered by insurance at all. What is covered by insurance in America are quickly implant only for children. So you need person, like private um, health insurance to help cover the cost of your hearing aid. It definitely does impact the design and possible range of the devices because most people just want the, they want the functionality aspect, right? I mean, they're paying down to them, down to the dollars. Um, and they just want something that basically meets the need. But I've been looking in Denmark, in Sweden, in Norway, where there were strong hearing aid companies. Um, Altarion, for instance, is rooted in Copenhagen, a long lasting company with decades of design. And um, they're much more innovative, mostly because people can afford to purchase different types of devices, knowing that they're covered by the health insurance. In Canada, it varies by province. Um, I lived in Ontario up until a few years ago when I moved to Delaware for my job. And I believe until 2001, if you were a child, hearing aids were covered by the Ontario government. And then after 2001, the provincial government changed some of the Ontario with disability assistive program so you can get a portion of your hearing aids covered and i will give you a stack dollars when i get there um but one of the challenge of this is you have to wait 13 years so you cannot always upgrade like you know the latest model comes out you cannot upgrade within that program so when i was a student at york university I was eligible for a new hearing aid and they cost $4,000 per pair, like each, so $8,000 total. And through the York University student health insurance, I got about um, half of that covered. So I'm now at $4,000 I owe. And the disability assistance program covered half of that. So now I'm at $3,000. That's a lot of money when you're essentially like a student who is working full time 
the remaining two downturns was covered by my mother's private insurance, um, which, which paid for it. But then I wasn't eligible again for another six years uh, to, for that Ontario assistive device plan. And by that time, I was out of school, so I didn't have that market. So I had to pay about a little over two grand on my own. Um, and I was unemployed, so I had to figure out a payment plan. That can be a lot for people. Um, so even though there are provincial measures in place to help people, when you're an adult, the cost gets harder and harder to cover. Um, it, it was incredibly difficult when I was unemployed. I had no way to pay for that, and I needed them. And it's not like I had a backup. It's not like I could just go to my older model and rely on that until I can upgrade. My backup were dead, which is why I'm getting a new one. And one of the, and I didn't mention this actually in my talk, um, but one of the biggest problems with this access um, and the way we design hearing aids is the reliance of digital technology also means acknowledging that, that digital technologies have a very short shelf life. Um, they die very quickly. The batteries themselves run out quickly because they need more energy to power the digital hearing aids. Um, digital hearing aids on average have a shelf life between three to five years. So imagine you saved your money, you got all your paperwork in order, and then in five years you have to do it all over again. Maybe less than that because you're waiting for the end to pay debt. And it's not repairable. Just like with any digital technology, usually when they break, they break, like they're dead. And this is like a climate um, crisis as well. Like we're destroying the environment by making things that are not fixable. In comparison, my analog hearing aids, the last pair I wore before I absolutely had to uh, shift to digital hearing aids, lasted me 12 years with conscious maintenance. I have heard that Starkey is bringing back analog hearing aids. Uh, they're bringing back certain kinds of models that are repairable, um, that you can maintain, which I think is really good. Um, but they're, they're still very selective. So they're not making new models. They are buying the older model and fixing them. So the same way you would buy like an old desktop computer and just like upgrade the hardware, that's what they're doing. Um, which also in one time seemed ridiculous that they're a billion dollar company and they can't make new things. They have to, you know, refurbish old technology. Thank you so much for that uh, answer. Thank you so much for your talk tonight. Thank you to everyone in the audience for your generous questions and feedback. Thank you to our two captioners tonight, James and Christy, as well as, sorry, our interpreters, James and Christy. Uh, sorry to make you say the wrong thing about yourself, <laughs> James, there. Uh, and thank you, Max, uh, for doing the captions. Thank you, Esli, for helping with the tech. And of course, thank you, Dr. J. Prebeer for your wonderful presentation. I wanna welcome you all to our ongoing events this semester, as well as recordings of past events. Um, if you're interested in more discussions around disability um, and technology, uh, we have a recording of our event with Alice Wong, for example, whose photo was in one of the slides tonight, um, as well as other events on related topics. So we hope to see you at our future events. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Let's see if you want to stop the recording. Yeah, we'll do. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Thank you, James. Thank you, Christy, so much um, for all of your interpretation.